Great. Good, good, good. Um, this is a public meeting and members of the public and press are permitted to report on the proceedings. Reporting includes filming, photography and making an audio recording and providing commentary on the proceedings. Please note this meeting is recorded and streamed live. These recordings are published on the relevant meeting page of the Council's website. By choosing to attend this public meeting, you are deemed to have given your consent to be filmed or recorded and for any footage to be broadcast or published. If the alarm sounds, the premises must be evacuated. Do not spend time collecting personal belongings. All emergency escape routes are clearly signed. Once you have left the building, the assembly point is on the high street opposite the Guild Hall. Members and other speakers are reminded to use their microphone when speaking. That's that done with. Uh, uh, item number one, the appointment of substitutes. Do we have an eight and nine? Yes. We have got three substitutes. Uh, Councillor Lamb is here for Councillor Hodges. Councillor Altaf for Councillor Lucy Hodgson. Councillor Ditter for Councillor Stanley. Thank you very much. And while we don't have apologies, um, Councillor Louis Stephen has given his apologies for tonight. If that could be recorded too. Okay, declarations of interest. Are there any? See none. We'll move on then to item number three public representations. I think we have uh, um, two uh, uh, members of the public who've requested to speak tonight um, Francis Lancaster and Danny Buffon. Um, Francis, let's, let's have you first. You have up to five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I know that everyone in this room, as I do, loves our city and cherishes its history and its heritage. And I'm also confident that you'll share my disappointment and the disappointment expressed in the report that you will consider tonight on uh, the Riverside and museums that Worcester with all our glorious history and heritage, has not simply not kept up with other uh, cathedral cities in terms of our tourist offer and spend, but has actually gone backwards. We have such a tremendous history and heritage here, not simply cathedral, porcelain museum, commandery, Tudor house, Greyfriars, but of course the, the Worcester News reminds us that in the development of our city, Worcester was in the past a significant inland port. Uh, it will be well known within this room that only a few yards down the road uh, is the probable site of the first uh, Worcester porcelain factory, one of the earliest uh, in this country. Uh, we see all around us the uh, evidence of the Georgian, Victorian, Tudor, Stuart history that has led up to this point to our um, democracy, uh, the center for uh, the beginning and the end of the Civil War, um, issues of accountability and censorship and freedom of expression are as alive now as they were then. So why is it that we can't make that count? Why can't we get the staycation money um, and the visitors to stay over in order uh, to do that? Um, one of the things that is in the tourism strategy and has been discussed for many years, or two of the things, are firstly to integrate all the tremendous attractions we have in this city, and secondly to have a proper uh, heritage and history trail. One of the weaknesses uh, is that even the cathedral is not well interpreted and set in its uh, setting. Um, the porcelain site um, there is not a trace of it, not even a plaque. But what would be the case if it was properly interpreted and people were directed from the site of the first factory to the museum now? And in this uh, project, there are, um, it concentrates on routes. But routes to what? Um, the report contains some hopeful assumptions, but it's short on evidence that transferring the Worcestershire soldier to the commandery uh, would increase footfall. There is the danger that the football would remain um, exactly the same. It has 
a section do something. But very often, the temptation to do something is a trap. If the council goes down this route, it is really kissing goodbye to that integrated uh, strategy and that uh, linking everything through interpretation that could bring in the visitors who would stay longer. Um, will this report and the actions that you're considering tonight integrate all the tremendous attractions that we have? Will it persuade people to spend more and stay longer? Is it properly evidenced? After um, mature reflection, the answer is no. Thank you. Um, as there is the agenda item this evening to support and approve the Worcester Town Investment Plan Stage 2 business case and summary documents, I'd like to take this opportunity to give some comments on the report and talk more generally about the approach to active travel and cycling in the city. Uh, I'm Dan Brothwell, I'm the current chair of Bike Worcester. Bike Worcester is a city-based cycling advocacy group. We're a voice for people choosing bikes as a mode of transport in Worcester and aim to get more people cycling by working with residents, the city and county councils, West Mercia Police, schools and businesses to enable and encourage more journeys by bike. This seems to align perfectly with both local and national government policies. We are people who use bikes as a mode of transport, sometimes called utility cycling, whether that's commuting to work, shopping, meeting friends or on the school run. From my perspective, I also own a car, I get around on foot and use trains, often in conjunction with my bike, so I describe myself as a car driving, bike riding pedestrian, rather than simplifying it just to a cyclist. Bike Worcester members use regular bikes, as well as adult trikes, trailers, hand cycles, cargo bikes and tandems. A few quick comments on the active travel document. Firstly, it's good news that all the proposals make financial sense, and doing nothing is the worst option but I suspect this will be the case for any considered active travel scheme in Worcester. Table 2.1 identifies 67 kilometres of cycle network in Worcester, which sounds like an impressive figure, but there's no comment on the quality of this provision. If the routes are scored on continuity, directness, connectivity, comfort, physical barriers, segregation from motor vehicles or pedestrians and width, most of it is poor, which then links to why it isn't well used. I know this because I've cycled them. Section 3.7 lists a number of non-quantifiable benefits such as enhanced perception of Worcester, time savings, contribution to net zero and health benefits. I'm not sure why these are non-quantifiable, particularly when compared to, for example, journey ambience, which was quantified in the report, and I would suggest these are considered in future analyses. In Table 2.8, Bike Worcester are identified as a key stakeholder, but we don't appear in, in the more comprehensive list in 6.8, section 6.8. And I certainly expect to be identified as a key stakeholder in any active travel projects going forwards. Um, my understanding is that we would all like to see an increase in modal shift in journeys from car to bike within Worcester. If I'm mistaken, please accept my apologies. Maybe it's worth a show of hands during your meeting. Uh, more journeys by bike will reap the multiple benefits to everyone as described in the report. Following meetings over the last year with Councillor Bayliss and Councillor Amos, it seemed all we should be talking about is how we make this happen. Worcester is a small city with about half of working people living in Worcester also being employed in Worcester, in addition to the vast majority of children living and being educated in the city. Within 20 minutes you can get from the centre of Worcester to the outskirts of the city by bike. The government report on decarbonising transport aims to have 50% of these journeys made on foot or bike by 2030. Having been interested more seriously in cycling advocacy in the last few years, I suggest a change of approach is needed. We need to take a view on what journeys could be made by bike instead of private motor vehicles and then seek to find out what the barriers are to making this happen. This needs to focus on destinations such as schools, shops, centres of employment and the city centre. At present, it seems cycle routes go in 
where they are convenient to build, for example, upgrading the canal towpath, as opposed to where they are needed, for example, routes north-south and east-west through the city centre or around schools. There also appears to be undocumented policies around trying to shave seconds off journey times by car at the expense of other forms of transport and that no road space can be taken from motor vehicles. If these are policies, please write them down so they can be scrutinised and, re and reviewed. I'd like to offer you all Bike Worcester as a resource. I don't know how many of you use a bike as a regular mode of transport, but you have to experience travelling at about 10 miles an hour to understand the barriers that are likely to stop other people choosing it. I'm happy to take any of you on guided tours of Worcester by bike to review some of these problems. It's also worth asking what barriers there are to you to making journeys by bike, as they're likely to be the same as other people. I think Bike Worcester can be best used by you in proposing and developing improvements to Worcester that can then be tested on a cost-benefit analysis as to which would have the greatest impact. The success of these schemes discussed in this report will be dependent on the detailed design, and again, Bike Worcester can assist with this. I've got one paragraph, if it's okay, to finish. The 50% of journeys by bike or foot by 2030 is an ambitious target, but achievable, particularly, particularly in a small city such as Worcester with continued development and change. Without this ambition, journeys by car will continue to increase, congestion will get worse, and Worcester will fall further behind more forward-thinking towns and cities in the UK and beyond. You're our leaders. If you want to do it, it's up to you to make it happen. But Bike Worcester are here to help. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom, for your contribution. All right. Uh, we'll move on to item number four, uh, the minutes of our meeting on the 8th of February. Uh, are those a true and accurate record of our meeting? Would you like to propose those? Yeah, proposed. Cool. Is that agreed? Agreed. Okay. Um, to receive the minutes of uh, the meeting of the Income Subcommittee held on the 9th of March. Are those uh, noted? Is that agreed? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so receive the minutes of the PNGP committee on the 2nd of March. Are those noted? Agreed. Thank you very much. All right, we move on to item number seven the town's investment plan. Uh, Cover, covering business cases for the two parts of it, Heritage and Riverside, and Active Travel. David Sutton has joined us. So, um, David, you're going to take us through it, I think. Thank you, Chair. Um, and, and thank you to our two public speakers for speaking on this item. I won't, won't refer to their comments during my presentation, but I'll be very happy to pick up with them outside of the meeting uh, to discuss these proposals further. So tonight we have uh, the second and third business cases from our town investment plan. Members will recall that the, uh, the first business case, the Seventh Centre for Health and Wellbeing, was approved by this committee back in December of last year. A confirmation from government of the funding and work is, is well advanced on site, I'm pleased to say. So tonight we have the second and third business cases. Uh, lengthy documents which are at the appendices. Uh, members have had the opportunity to, to read through the detail. I'll just cover some of the, uh, the major points which are, are outlined in the report. So firstly, looking at the Heritage and Riverside uh, business case. Uh, this is unchanged from those in the project confirmation documents the committee approved previously and submitted to government. And, and you will recall that the project scope was amended from the original town investment plan uh, following the funding award. So we have £640,000 of town investment plan funding uh, supporting uh, a total investment of 583,000 match funding that comes from the cathedral, uh, the Militu Museums Trust, a local philanthropist and a local charitable trust. The value for money assessment has been completed, which focuses on the benefits that are attributable to that town's fund funding. The benefit cost ratio is 2.2 and a net positive uh, net present social value of 1.2 million. Anything above about 1.3, 1.4 is, is seen as a good uh, benefit cost ratio. Uh, there are also non-quantifiable benefits um, which haven't, haven't been costed um, but shouldn't be overlooked as improved perception of Worcester as a visitor destination um, and some of the enhanced uh, 
land value and employment benefits which, are, which will arise from these uh, proposals. Council will be delivering the majority of this project directly ourselves, um, with the exception of some landscaping works at Worcester Cathedral. There will be a funding agreement which will uh, cover the, uh, the funding to make sure that the conditions uh, of our grant from government are met. At that point, Chair, perhaps I'll pause and invite questions on that particular business case before I move on to the second one. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've read the case a couple of times, David, and, and I was involved in Towns Fund at the start of these projects and discussions on the wider uh, proposals, and then obviously the, the slightly whittled down proposals as a result of the um, funding decision. Um, I mean, I, regardless of the, of the the withdrawal of certain aspects of it, I felt that the, the proposal was pulling together some of the issues that we talked about over many, many years about tourism and um, culture and heritage in the city. And I was just struggling to understand why um, we're hearing that this is not an integrated approach. And I, I wondered what your thoughts were on, on what you heard earlier on this evening about um, saying goodbye to an integrated strategy when, when it, it feels to me as though that's exactly what we do have here. I think we, we have, I mean, we, we certainly have a, a smaller programme than we'd originally laid out in the town investment plan. We've got some discrete projects. They, they do knit together uh, linking heritage assets and the riverside. They're not the whole of the city. So I think to answer your question I'd say that these are integrated together but clearly we've got a wider wider heritage and network across the city and uh, we can we can look at that in future years and sorry chair but, but just in terms of because I've not been on the board uh, since um, I was removed last year um, what, what how, how widespread is the view of the board in support of this uh, obviously everyone's going to stick their hand in the air and say yes we support it uh, but it might be that there's one, only one element of the board that's driving this. Is it, is it um, a comprehensive approach from the Townsend board and its representation? Yes, yeah, apologies for not mentioning that earlier. This, uh, both of these business cases have been unanimously supported by the town, town board, um, taking the discussion through moving from our original proposals to, to these that are in this, this report tonight. So all of those elements have been discussed to the town board and there was unanimous support for the proposal. I mean, is it possible to ask actually who is on the town board? What is the, the representation? Perhaps I can. David, you might have the full list, but um, City Council it's, it's always been the leader in the deputy. This is Professor Dean from the parish councils. Two representatives, Roger and I, I think is one from St. Peter's and Robin Walker, a member of parliament, is on the These are all mandatory, or a number of these are mandatory any town. Um, Sally Ellison, representing the voluntary sector. It's chaired by Craig Mool, who's the chief exec of uh, Sanctuary Housing. But we have the Dean of the, of the uh, Cathedral, we have uh, uh, Simon Geraghty, Seven Arts. It's, uh, yeah, I, I may have missed one or two, but yeah, there's pretty much a broad spectrum of civil society in the city. That's Norka. Yeah, thank you. So just following on from Lynn's question about the group does that and if you look at it politically wise greens on the board are there any any labor lib dem or, or greens on, on uh so there was obviously when we were in our control the leader and deputy leader came from two different parties the parish councils put forward their own whoever they are i mean i don't think any of our parish councillors in the city are 
officially, politically, one way or the other of any persuasion. There are, there are Green members, Labour members, Lib Dem members and, and Conservative members on parish councils, but I don't think there, any of them are identified as parishes. Uh, the leader of the county council is the leader of the county council. Passing. Uh, but the board is, as I say, the board is largely dictated by the department. They say all your principal local authorities and your parish councils need to be represented in where parliament has to be, so whoever they may be. Thank you, Chair. I've got a sort of overarching question about the, um, the project management um, funding. Um, uh, £5,000 a year sort of implies, depending on the costs, maybe one day a fortnight. Uh, I'm just wondering whether that's sufficient to manage the project or whether it's also sort of in-house sort of posts being used. Thank you. So th those are programme management costs, which will refer to the, the overall uh, management of the program and the reporting back to the department, uh, monitoring the valuation. They are, they, are, they are fairly light touch on this particular project. It's quite a small project, so um, portion which is a portion to this one is, is relatively small. Uh, project management and delivery fees are within the project itself, so they were there within those. Thank you, Chair. And, and just before I move on, the, uh, the, the membership of the town board is on the council's website and the uh, investment plan is there. Schedule of meetings. So I, think, I think you've got most of them there, Chair. There's a couple more. Some members may wish to. Wish to. So the, the second business case is, is for active travel, the active travel project. Um, this is un, unchanged from those in the town investment plan. Um, again, unanimously supported by the town board in December. And unchanged from those proposals were approved by this committee and submitted to government. The, the TIP funding here is 4.5 million, um, which supports an investment of over 10 million pounds that comes from Worcestershire County Council and from, from this council from monies previously approved uh, for the uh, Bags Bridge. Value for money assessment again focuses on the total benefits for the Towns Fund funding, um, benefit cost ratio of 1.8. SV of four million pounds, higher net present social value uh, of 13 million for the overall project. Uh, the benefit cost ratio remains the same because that's scaled up depending on the investment which is put in. Again, there are non-quantifiable benefits uh, which are listed there. Not part of that, uh, that assessment. I'm happy to take some questions at that point, I think, and then I will talk about what happens next in the process. Um, on, on this one, David, it's um, interesting that um, what we heard earlier on in, in the evening about a general focus around um, existing cycleways and networks um, being extended, um, a general um, latching on, if you like, to uh, Riverside, Topath, those kind of places, as opposed to um, tackling one of the issues about um, actual road space and road usage. Um, how how um, flexible is this plan um, in the light of any any recommendations which come forward from the Worcester City Centre Transport Strategy, when that sees the light of day, the the plan and in the business case it details uh, three elements to this project. Really, one is active travel routes, which is the new cycling routes, which we which we're talking about now. I'll come I'll come back to. The second one is the Kipax Bridge, which I'm sure members are well well aware of the details of that. And then the third one is a bike hire scheme for the city. So the first element of that, the active travel corridors, there are three routes. Three routes. One is, is quite right, is, is the canal towpath. Um, it's town fund is focusing on an extension of the surfaced path. 
that would take you north of Pud as well, up to Blackpool and the estate up there. But at the moment, that's an unmade path that gets rather muddy and is quite, is quite narrow. Um, the second one is extending, effectively extending the riverside path, that's quite correct, from Diglis uh, down across Duck Brook, and it will join up at Dace Close, so a good proportion of the way to down towards the catch, and clearly linking outside the city boundary and, and on to Kemsey at some point. So that is an unmade path at the moment, so that would be a new route that's not really cyclable at the moment. And then the third one is around Ronxwood, so some quite extensive um, new surface paths around Ronxwood that are currently unmade and not used as cycle routes, linking that Ronxwood community uh, with the hospital, with County Hall, into town, and then off, on up towards Lippard Grange, and then on into Warnden, and the network, and up to Blackpool Trading Estate. That answers your question, Councillor. How, when the city transport strategy becomes available, how will, how will we react? So those, those three routes uh, are the proposals that are going forward and are asking the committee to approve tonight. I would not expect a significant amendment to those. Um, I'm sure they will, they will link in to other routes around the city. It will be part of the consideration of the transport. Have you explored any other options besides cycle routes? Because cycle routes, is, it can also pass a not adequate cycle infrastructure. Dan will tell you no cycle. Um, and the other thing is, is this bike hire scheme? Maybe I've missed that in uh, papers. Where is that? and located because unless we're going to encourage the county council to make adequate provision on roads for safe segregated cycle lanes i fail to see where people will be bikes if we have a pspo in place preventing people where are we planning on asking thank you um first firstly to talk about the canal towpath that that's one element of this. We did, we worked extensively with the County Council and our County Council Highways colleagues, who this is their responsibility and their remit, the Highways officers. We've spent a lot of time um, with them developing proposals. This is an extension of the, of the existing. Um, the towpath is used quite extensively by cyclists. I do take your point about the width of the towpath. It's, it's, but it's a, it's a used route at the moment. So there's some improvements to that. And then obviously the new routes. Um, they, they will be they will be up to modern standards. The improvements that have gone in though aren't really big improvements though when you think about it. I know people um but I mean correct me if I'm wrong, there's no lighting that's got barriers and the colour of the thing now actually looks like the canal. If you're cycling down there at night, it's really hard to distinguish between what is the path, what is the canal. It's still very safe for people to go cycling down. It may not get as muddy because it's paved, but it's still wholly inadequate for cycling. It's quite nice for walking, but it's not acceptable for cycling. It is important to note that these are active travel routes. So whilst we've done, we've done a lot of talking about cycling this evening, and our public speaker has been from the cycling community, uh, walking is equally a part of active travel. The longer the journey, the more attractive cycling becomes. Um, I, I take the points about, about the colour of the highway. Um, everything that would be done would be done through county highways and would be clearly would be compliant. I can take those points away for discussion with it. And so the bike hire scheme, we're at a very early stage on the bike hire scheme. We've done some research uh, around other cities. Um, I've visited Hereford and actually used the bike hire scheme there, which is very widespread. Without going into too much detail, bikes are uh, GPS tracked. They're parked in geofenced bike parks all over the city, a high number of those. The actual detail of where they would be would be something that we'd have to work out with the, uh, with the contractor at the procurement stage. Our vision would be that they would be located in, in many locations around the city, including out in the communities as well as, as, well as in the city centre. 
daily cycling is something that is done on road and as well as off road and segregated cycle lanes. Thank you, Chair. Um, leading on from Councillor, we didn't tag team this, by the way. It's leading on from uh, um, previous discussion on the towpaths, and it kind of leads into some of the strategy in item number eight regarding the new quality, diversity, and inclusion strategy and the routes that we've got highlighted here. I mean, just looking at it from a, a purely a women's perspective, some of these routes aren't, aren't safe for women to travel at night. Highlighted this on a number of occasions through the, uh, the police crime, through the communities committee and the funding that the police crime commissioner gave regarding on the back of the Sever Arverard case. Now we've had several cases along the riverside on a couple of years ago of people exposing themselves or abusing women. That kind of needs to be addressed, that we have, do have an issue with poorly lit routes, whether they be for cyclists, whether they be for runners, whether they be for walkers. There are pockets of areas along our riverside and along the town that, that women simply do not feel safe going along. So that kind of needs to be addressed in this strategy to make sure that from an equality and diversity and Im impact that somebody goes along uh, you know, to assess those and address those properly. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that the um, town, the membership of the town investment plan board is specified by central government. It might not be what we would choose if we were given rain. Having said that, within the business case, there is no there is no reference. Worcester City Council is there a strategic direction in figure one point one, but in the governance organization and the decision making, there is no where does the city council actually come into it? Where does P and R come into it? Where does the health and well being committee come? into it and I think what we're hearing from conversation and the discussion so far is that actually the majority of the city council and local people have not been engaged in this process so it was I think the first most of us um, was aware of the bike hire scheme was when we read something in and how can we, how can, where does the City Council appear in this and how can we get some more robust um, engagement? Just to answer that point, Lynn, you have had an opportunity to be engaged in the development of the town's plan. There's been member seminars. There was one during COVID we had, which was an online seminar. I believe you were there. Certainly the number of members were there. Um, You've obviously seen this is a detailed business case. You, you as a member of this committee, approved the, uh, the overall town size bid, which included the detail, included the broad uh, thrust of all these projects were listed in previous reports. I'll ask officers to provide you with details of what you've had before, but you've, you have personally, and all of us collectively, have been in, involved in, in the development of these projects for some time. The actual detail of the detail of the business plan has come forward uh, now at, the, at this stage, but the outline of each of the five projects has been you know, has been approved by PNR. And there's been previous reports on it that you must have read and seen before. But I'll, I'll make sure that officers provide you with a copy of what, where we've what we've done before. Oh, it's Councillor Mitchell. Yeah, uh, th thank you, Chair. <coughs> um, firstly, thanks to officers because it's a very good report, very detailed report. Uh, going to add a bit of positivity, I think, tonight, because at the moment everyone seems to have found reasons why this isn't a good thing. Um, I do cycle. Um, I can see the benefits of this incre increased cycle paths. Um, I take the comments that um, it may be uh, less uh, attractive for young or uh, ladies in particular to cycle along elements of the towpath in the evening. However, my memory is correct because I wanted a lot put lights on the west side of the river many years ago, but we are not allowed to 
because of the environmental impact of the fauna and flora on that side. So, you know, there are other environmental to cycle along any dark towpath at night um, if you can't light it. Oh, and I probably wouldn't want to cycle along there myself at night. Um, but go out on their bikes and stretch their legs. Um, and actually, the fact that it's out of town is better because it does get congested around um, the Ideal to have people travelling at 20 kilometres a mile, which I do see some people do. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, more space to cycle thank and walk. Councillor Alcock. Yeah, thank you. Um, as I do cycle on occasion, but I'm not a cyclist. I know it was locked down like many other people. I did explore cycling. I do welcome improvement. But I think they were more. I think someone said the best type is it will make no difference to me. It will not encourage me. Won't help with the. But I think obviously everything comes down from at that level and um, policy. As I was named, well, I don't sit on county, you do. So therefore, you've got more chance of having influence on that than me. So, um, but, but it, it, I don't, it may you're not, not personally, it may not encourage Remember, you to not cycle. Bitter, Chris. You're not bitter. No, 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 yeah, I lost two elections. Um, I, I, it, 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 it may not encourage you personally, but if there's more cycle routes, I would have thought it would have encouraged more people to cycle or walk or use an electric scooter or whatever mode of transport they want to use that isn't a car. I mean, I would cycle now from my house much more comfortably down that route. And I live on the edge of the city, especially road. And I can do it without having to touch a road, is, um, which I think is pretty good. Okay. David, I'm going to uh, uh, buy to you, Penny Lewis, and then I'll let you come back on all of them. I just wanted to say that um, I'd, uh, question, a question on the bike hire scheme. Um, uh, I, I personally uh, hoped that we would be looking at uh, maybe electric bikes as well, if not in instead of normal bikes. We're a hilly city, more particularly on the east side. Um, having recently been lent a, uh, an electric bike by a member of the Bike Worcester Fraternity, uh, local to me, uh, uh, for two weeks. I, I enjoyed it and found it uh, you know, a revelation, really, in terms of um, the, the difference it makes uh, to, um, to uh, those of us who haven't cycled a long way for a long time. Um, but uh, I just wondered, is there an update on, on the, avail the possibility of it being electric bike instead of uh, pedal power yeah. only? A mix, a mix would be the, the preferred model. Um, we we uh, engaged with a number of existing schemes. They've actually found the Hereford experiences, whilst the majority of their bikes are uh, not electric, they I think they have about 30% electric bikes. The electric bikes actually do about 70% 70, 70 of the total mileage. So they are used for longer journeys, very popular. And as time goes on, we've... that'll be something. Have you, uh, Louise wants to come back, but was there any questions to anybody else's points? Did you want to make any other points first? And then... I was just going to sum up, really. Okay, so I'll take Louise now, then, please. Just to kind of expand on your point. I've always been quite... Well, an e -card. They are, I, I, that, I think, is something worth looking at. And I know that where I am now in Witchhaven, there's a well there for business. We have, we have the current Woo Bike scheme um, 
run through the university, and we've, uh, we've got government funding that we're working to try and expand that out. Into the we've looked at some trailer bikes and also looking at cargo bikes for that. That would be a, a business, certainly something we can look at. Oh, sorry, Councillor Gregson. Just following on from the discussion about, about engagement and governance, I, I wasn't sure what stage David was at, but um, can, can you just clarify, like, going forward? Because in, in the DIS document, um, all the engagement seems to be with officers, county or city, um, not with members. Can you, can you clarify what the, the role of members is going forward? So you're asked tonight to, to support, um, support the recommendation. I'll talk through those in a minute. They're specific to the art gallery. The intention would be that these projects will report back to committees. I think they're scorecards across a number of a number of the committees. So they will all report back. Uh, clearly, where there's some structural work or there's some money to be spent, then our usual procurement rules would apply. So the, those that are level that would need to come back to members would do. There's also a number of these are at ward level, so some ward level member engagement. I'm thinking the bike hire scheme is likely to involve most of our members, I would suggest. There's, there's more work to be done on the project delivery. Would be very much engaged and kept up. Chair, I just wanted to add that obviously the purpose of the major project reference group members cited at all stages of their delivery, um, not just the reception stage, but also actually in having set the member reference group up, this committee will remember that as a mechanism, committee system with themes as a place to make sure that. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Councillor Ellis. Thank you, Councillor Gregson. Thank you, Thank you for that. I, I think there is a difference between receiving lots of information, active engagement, engagement in stakeholding, developing plans, and you know, co-production is a phrase used elsewhere. And I think Councillor Alcott's question about the diversity of, of the It's obviously politically diverse. Um, is is there any moment it's not diverse any other way? And that is pertinent in terms of um, gender balanced decision making and as active is. So, yeah. I, I, I can't remember the exact number, but the, the, the representative from Warning Villages is a, a representative from Seven Arts to help you with that. Okay. Uh, David, do you want to deal with the recommendations? The first one is that the committee's. Summary documents in the appendix, which is what we need to submit to government. It's a matter for the council as the accountable body to support the business case, not for government, but government. And complete the funding agreements. Third one, as part of the from the art gallery Mandry, there is currently a hosting agreement uh, in place. Uh, within the report and we will need to terminate that and enter into yeah, of course um just in terms of the process so this is about submitting uh, a document to uh, the department for leveling up homes and communities when do we expect to hear back? Um, you know, do we have to wait for an answer? 
what happens next. David, can, can you help so, with that? So, I mean, I'm in close contact with our departmental contact, um, fully appraised, and they know they know what's coming. So, we're expecting those surprises. Mechanism of government, I would suspect, would take us probably three before we get the formal contract. Uh, in the meantime, based in the business details, how we will deliver projects and we'll, wheels will be moving. Okay. If there is no other comment on that, then can I move that the committee supports recommendations 1.1 through to 1.3? So is that seconded? Yeah, Councillor McCain. Okay. Can we put that to a vote then, please? All those in favour? I think that's very much. <coughs> we'll move on. I can find my agenda. Um, Okay, we're on to item eight. Um, just an update on this. It's uh, labelled capital and investment strategies. Um, you haven't been sent the investment strategy. You've only been sent the capital strategy. Um, uh, rather than try and give you it on the hoof and bounce you into it, I have sought advice and we can simply take it straight to council next week, the investment strategy. Um, and that would give you enough time to properly read and digest it and bring any proper issues through. Um, uh, so I'm hearing from my, from my right that um, Mr Flynn will speak to both of them, but I, I just didn't want from a governor's perspective, you haven't had the report, for me to ask you to vote on it tonight seemed a little odd. So we'll, we'll take a summary of it, um, but we'll just approve, if, if that's in your agreement, the capital plan. So. Mark, sorry, my... <laughs> Mark, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the uh, capital inv and investment strategies are a requirement from SIPFA that we review them annually and they're approved by Council before the start of the new financial year. Um, the capital strategy sets out the Council's uh, capital programme um, that was approved as part of the budget back in February. Includes the, uh, the sources of financing for that uh, programme, be it uh, seats, uh, grant funding, borrowing, etc. And um, that leads us on to then setting the council borrowing uh, limits uh, for the, which you'll see from the report for next year is set at 36 million. Put that into context, the current borrowing is uh, just over 20 million, which gives us 16 million. Pounds headroom um, borrowing that could be taken at the moment, um, subject to any um, new projects that come along. There isn't borrowing. <coughs> um, it is a, a fairly detailed technical report, um, but I'm happy. Investment structure now. Um, essentially, the investment strategy follows the, uh, the, same, uh, the same format um, as last year. Um, obviously, um, compared to a couple of years ago, the Council's investment strategy has been curtailed somewhat um, by the uh, requirements from SIPFA and government that um, investments should be restricted to um, rather than out-and-out uh, out property investments that are solely for income-generating purposes. They need to be uh, have more broader aims in, for example, um, regeneration of the, of, of the city, which, of course, we're doing as part of the future high streets. Um, but nevertheless, it, it remains for us to have that strategy in place, which is... Questions on the capital? Thank you. It's probably a daft question. I'm quite sure we don't, but bearing in mind, we obviously don't have any. That's correct. Definitely not. Sorry? 
Okay, if there are no questions on it, can I put that to the vote then? All those in favour of the capital plan strategy and we'll take the investment one straight to capital. Agreed? Thank you. Unanimous as well. Thank you very much. And we move on to item nine, a new equality, diversity and inclusion strategy. Sean, I believe you're producing, uh, presenting this item. Thank you, Chair. Um, the committee will remember that last year um, it approved a set of proposals to bring um, the Council's work on equality, diversity and inclusion back into focus, really. Um, we set some new equality objectives, one of which was to undertake a self-assessment of our own um, progress against the local government's equalities framework. And we published equality actions around that. So this report brings back to the committee for approval a new three-year equality, diversity and inclusion strategy for the as a result of the work that was undertaken. And the report recommends that um, immediately adopt a new equality objective to achieve excellence as set out in the strategy to consider appointing a member champion for equality, diversity, inclusion to support the work programme that the strategy and the And to note that the personnel and general purpose subcommittee would be a um, perfect candidate to oversee the annual action plan brought back to this. So with your permission, Chair, I'll just pick out some of the salient points of the... Of the... So um, uh, the committee will recall that, um, uh, you know, the protected characteristics under the Equality Act are wide-ranging, um, they're extensive, and therefore they impact on all of us. I think that's a clear framework um, which to recognise that progressing equality diversity is everyone's business, serve of individual groups. Or particular causes it's 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 everybody um, it may have an impact on any stage in their life so that's quite clear there are still some clear legal obligations on the council as well it's, this is not all about complying with legal obligations it's important to remember that as a public body the local authority is under an equality duty and sector we've been given positive duties to advance equality of opportunity as well as collecting and monitoring data on our workforces and public objectives. The uh, work we've done on the self-assessment has taken us a, through a structured approach. The Local Government Association's framework is very extensive. It's a very, very detailed document. There are four focus areas, understanding and working with communities, leadership, partnership and organisation commitment, responsive services and customer care, and diverse and engaged workforce. And it's, it's a very structured and objective way that you can assess performance. And I've set out in the report, you know, the level of response we've had has been really excellent. Involvement, we've had more than 50 staff take part in a series of workshops. We've had really good engagement at two sessions with councillors, um, some colleagues, councillor colleagues in that regard. Um, and overall, it felt like we've had a very deep and thorough discussion and an honest assessment of where we are. And in summary, that assessment is that overall we could consider ourselves to be We do have some pockets of excellent practice. We do have some areas where we are clearly still developing. And one of those is around the use of data to inform service plan. Um, in the covering report, we highlight some of our excellent practice. And I think it really is important to pay tribute to many, many happening at a local service level and leadership that councillors give on this all sorts of activities which are going on that our council can rightfully be proud of. And some highlighted areas for improvement which we recognise and which we are which we are committed to. Those have really that's a summary of some of the information that made its way into the strategy document. The purpose of the strategy is to produce something that's quite accessible and plain English and readable and practical. Um, the, the the if you like the boxes in there reflect the local government association's framework. So against each box, so to speak, we set out where, why, where we are with it, why we're currently achieving, and how we can get to be excellent. So it gives us a set of practical measures. To supplement that, we wanted to put in place with a set of measures that we think is achievable in each year. So rather than write out everything that we're going to do across, set out our targets for the first year, and then personal and general purposes hold that as their work plan throughout the year. 
potentially an equalities champion. Support that work plan. But you know, progress is made. And bring that back to this committee. It would be um, obviously useful and appropriate to make sure that the adopted strategy is available in an accessible format and accessible language. So that's been one of the um, considerations in drafting some taken and, and turned it uh, readable and hopefully a document that people do feel they can have ownership over because I think that's one of the turning points from this is the ownership and confidence play their part so chair um i think i've already um rattled through the implications stations at the start and obviously i'm happy Thank you very much sean for a very um, comprehensive overview of the what we've got before us tonight speakers on the phone that's okay yeah thank you chair um in relation to uh, paragraph eight in the um, in, in the report, talk about it's good to see that all staff. That means all staff have that responsibility about challenging behaviour, and it's, it talks about managers ensuring all staff are aware of their personal responsibilities, um, ensuring all staff are supported and trained to relevant standards. Have we got to that stage yet? Do you think you know are all staff aware that it's not just a manager's responsibility challenge? wrongful behaviour, but it's their duty as well. Through you, Chair. I think one of the pieces of feedback we had in the self-assessment is, is we have a very um, a workforce that are very committed to doing the right thing, but there's, in some respects, a lack of confidence about what to say and how to challenge and, and being equipped to have the right conversations. So there, there is a real enthusiasm to bring training back to the fore, face-to-face -face training in particular, um, for staff at all levels, and in fact, that was a feedback in relation to councillors as well. To equip people with the knowledge and the confidence to make a contribution, really. Councillor yes. Yes. Councillor Dennis. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I commend the officers on the report? It's really, really a, a significant moment within certainly within recent living memory of how we've tackled the agenda and got, got stuck in on it and, and started li actually listening and implementing. If there was any minor criticism if thought of this, it is the detach of the senior leadership team. In terms of the senior leadership team getting involved things on, in the day-to-day -day out there, hear it as the mystery shoppers. Uh, uh, amongst their people from from that point of view. That's the only thing that I would add to it, but I think it's a good piece of work. Thank you very much. Councillor Denham. Yeah, absolutely. I want to you know, praise Sean for, for this piece of work and taking it forward in a structured way as the um, poser of the motion um, years ago. Um, regard to looking at equality and diversity within the have, have taken um, the LGA structured approach and to be working through that is, is really really positive and I think you know from conversations it's it's identified a number of things that you know throughout the organization people weren't necessarily aware of and I, I suppose you know as a someone who's been the sort of informal champion for equality, diversity and inclusion since I became a councillor um, for the last 12, 10 years. It has seemed a somewhat lonely furrow at times, you know, and I'm just reflecting on, you know, the effort that it took to actually get disabled access to the council. And hopefully, you know, with the structure that we have now, we can more proactively um, see those things. And you know, we, at the Health and Wellbeing Committee yesterday, we had a um, report regarding Access Able. Again, you know, it was a really good project about um, increasing uh, visitors' numbers and being 
exclusive for visitors. So we know the council paid for that, set up that project, but actually we haven't really promoted it and visit Worcester are not using it. So there is still a huge amount of potential, but I think you know, the framework and working through it systematically absolutely praise the really good things that are happening. But there is a journey to go and uh, yeah, we're all hopefully on the same. Okay, if I can therefore, um, the, com the committee has asked uh, to, that the committee notes the work, approves the proposed strategy and action plan, approves the immediate publication of the equality objective to achieve excellence, agrees to recommend to the Council the appointment of a member champion for equality and diversity and inclusion, and notes that PNGP subcommittee will oversee the annual uh, action plan and report back to the committee on progress with the strategy annually. I move those all from the chair. Uh, seconded by Lynn. Oh. You want, you want to ask a, qu a question? Okay, yeah, carry on. Sorry, I thought you'd made your, sorry, I thought you'd made your contribution. No, it's, I mean, um, so the appointment of a member champion, when, when are we putting names forward or what's the process? I think that's a, a matter for full council, so it will be a, it will be a, come forward to the next council, I assume, I don't know, is it on the agenda for next week? Chair, so um, it would come as a referral item from this that PNR would be recommending to full council that a new member champion be identified by the function of full council to Good appoint one. Okay. Yes, Chris. It, it, it's a question. If the PNGP committee is um, going to be driving the strategy or response, does that intimate that the champion should be on that committee? It's a genuine question. I'm, I think I've taken my cue from the, um, we've got a sort of dive, dive, a range of different approaches to member champions so far. I think that it isn't necessarily a prerequisite. No. Um, I, the committee needs to hold offices to account and hold that work programme to account and make sure that action plan gets delivered by that appropriate level of challenge. Um, the member champion um, fill a different role in terms of glue between the committees, getting raised provides, again, support around, around this sort of... No other questions up? Louise? Sorry, correct me if I'm wrong, but... Okay. Okay. So, uh, can I... I've moved the recommendations one... 0.1 to 1.5. I think uh, Dean is seconded. Can we put those to the vote? All those in favour? Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you very much. Item 10, the staff pay award. Um, Sean, are you going to um, lead on this? Thank Declare you, Chair. An interest and lead on this? <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, all officers have an interest in this okay. item. Um, the, the report does not make recommendations. The report sets out facts, and it's, it's firmly a matter for members to decide what you want to do. The, rep the purpose of bringing the report tonight is to note that, um, as, a, as a direct consequence of the union and staff negotiations, a, a pay award has now been agreed, and this council will implement that. That's 1.75%, and I know members. The council has made budget provision for payment up to 2% paper sets out reasons why uh, that's been allocated to make 5% um, and the reason that that has been brought forward to address um, pay anomalies, our, our spinal points compared to the national spinal point, goes back um, almost the cost savings. So that pay freeze was then lifted year, um, it's had the effect of putting us pay spine. So the, the report sets out if members chose to use the budget to address this um, uh, 
recovery position, it would make a, a contribution towards that. Close the gap, it would make a contribution. Uh, we consulted with West Midlands employers about this, and they're very clear that their advice is that collective bargaining applies and this changing the one point supplemental. So I guess that's a procedural point. Um, and on their full chain, it's absolutely a matter of members what you wish to do, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Sean. I think, uh, personally, taking the extra 0.25, making the award 2%, um, was, it will only be a small gesture, but it will be something extra, uh, and will close the gap, as you say, between our positions on spinal points and, and national average if you were in a position somewhere else so I'd like to recommend that we accept the two percent both a two percent increase rather than 1.75 seconded anybody wish to speak that as a denim I mean I, th I think it's an interesting point of reflection isn't it that for you know, a relatively short term Twenty-four. There's the long-term impact. Day. Day. We budgeted for two. other organisations. Okay, I'm going to put that in any other contribution. So I'll put that to a vote. All those in favour? Unanimous. Thank you very much. We'll move on to item number 11, the proposed com uh, committee scorecard. Shane, are you there? Yeah, thank you, Chair. This is um, the stage we've reached in the, in the municipal year where we're looking to set the, reset the scorecard for each of the committees. Um, in, this, in this particular case, we have to make a decision about what remains within the remit of policy and resources and what is the remit of the other committees. And so we've tried to do that uh, by making a division between agreeing the, the business cases, as we've been doing this evening. Uh, those, those elements will then go on to emergency delivery. During the course of this, this previous year, we've completed a number of items. The city plan refresh has been complete. The town investment plan was published. Uh, the Keypax Bridge has been brought to the planning stage. And the Future High Streets Fund, much of the stage one uh, setting out of the seven interventions has been done. So elements of those will then go on to other committees to be considered. And we've also uh, proposing to remove our excellence projects and activities. Now, I hasten to, to assure members that we're still committed to each of these projects, but in terms of reporting them on the scorecard, we didn't feel that was adding much value to the work of the committee. But what we will undertake to do is bring back reports at key stages in the development of those, so that, for instance, such as the equalities and diversity strategy. Can also address those. And in terms of the key, uh, the key performance indicators, there are a couple of variations, but the main change is that we're now trying to, and we have been for some while, trying to get a better understanding of what our customers think about us and how they work with us. And we're putting in a whole new set of uh, indicators around our responsiveness to tax, the satisfaction that customers have, trying to get some understanding. So we're doing some baseline work during the course of this those Yes. So those are the, the, the primary changes that we've, uh, we've made to the scorecard. And um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to address those. But those, that's the proposed scorecard going forward next year. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Gregson, and then Councillor Stafford. Could you just explain the, uh, the bit about removing the achieving excellence? It implies that we don't excellence anymore, which I'm sure is not the case. Uh, through you, Chair, that's certainly not the case, yes. The, 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 uh, during the course of the last year, and possibly I think previously as well, a number of these items were on there, 
but they, are, they form part of business as usual for the most part. So it's only when we get to some key stage in the process that it becomes important to bring it to the committee's attention. Engagement. So rather than having an update quarterly, which, which uh, it doesn't necessarily indicate any progress, I will bring reports as and when it's important to do so. Rather than standing idle. It seemed a, a, a way of perhaps focusing more attention on key aspects of those rather than having. Yes, sir, Stafford. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a question on, on the KPIs. Um, do they all sort of flow up from KPIs that are sort of overseen at other committees so that we're getting a selection or the overarching KPIs, or these are sort of a unique set of KPIs that are just for this committee? Three years, yeah. These are specific to this committee. So, okay. so uh, hierarchy, or there are underlying um, bits of management information which are available within the Pentagon. Don't report those. But we can drill down into more detail if members want. Personally, I think I mean, I'm, I'm happy to roll with this at this moment, but I, I'd like, I wonder if members Members might like to have a little bit of a working group looking at this going forward and perhaps making sure that the, the, the indicators are measuring the right things rather than just what we can currently measure. Because um, it doesn't feel like a necessarily like a coherent overview of the committee's work. So perhaps we, we I don't know what other members feel, but for me I feel like we ought to perhaps during the next year have a little bit of a review, checking that these are the things that matter. We're measuring the right things. Yes, so there, Denham, do you want to come in? Yes, I mean, I've got um, questions around the proposal we've got here. And I mean, one, one aspect is that, you know, um, well, had a look actually at the measures that we've got um, at the back of the, the refreshed city plan has got, you know, a, a large number of suggested measures, um, some of which at the minute don't appear to have a home. So um, we suggested that some were appropriate for Health and Wellbeing Committee last night. Um, tendencies at Worcester Food Bank, um, Hospital Admissions due to obesity, um, fuel poverty are ones that fit with, with that agenda. So on the same basis of look, looking at the measures, which presumably, you know, are measures, measures that are here in the city. Um, there's a couple that don't sound like they've got an obvious home. So, for example, election turnout, that one that should be for this committee, um, and number of assets on the at-risk level, where those go. Ed, uh, uh, certainly the second one I would have thought would have been place based rather than rather than healing, but that's just my personal view on that place and economic development. But Shane, do you have a view on those? Um, uh, if you, Chair, in addition to the, the ones that go to the committees, we every year produce a state of the city report which goes through that set of indicators. So they are all considered uh, as well as being in, in where, where appropriate. Um, yes, Ped looks at the, the one around the, the assets, and the one around the elections, I think, would fit with P and GP, which could cover David. Wrong button. Sorry, I'm out of practice. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you, Chair. I think uh, in answer to Councillor Denham's question, I'd just like to add um, another, another aspect to that is that um, with regards to the city plan, what we are trying to present there is the indication of performance of the city as a place. Um, so you, things like air quality uh, and like, you know, problems in terms of community well-being indicators. And, and use those indicators to help shape it, uh, policy decisions in the future so we can look at how the city is performing. With regard to the scorecard that we've got in front of us today, 
that's more about how the council is performing rather than the city as the So it's it's around milestones around projects that indicate the activity that they're undertaking. Now I know sometimes there can be one could argue there is a between the two, but we are trying to have a set of indicators that look at the, the wider city performance and how that can help shape policy decisions. Then a set of indicators about how we are doing as a city council projects. Okay, so uh, Lynn, sorry, you want to come back? I mean, there's a discussion to be had there, isn't there, in terms of being our act. Um, putting that to, to one side, um, a question again with regard to suggested scorecard. So, um, under new projects, it's got active travel, business case approval. And last night had been committee scorecard, active travel investment. different who's who's actually going to be doing it david thank you through you chair this is the differentiation between the decision around the approval of the business case decision that the committee has taken tonight then the ongoing oversight of the delivery of the projects so if you take um, those projects that are relative to the environment or to the community place and economic development, the ongoing, uh, we've positioned those on an ongoing basis within communities, environment or PED appropriate, rather than bringing in all of those back to this bill that are better placed uh, where those members more um, intimate knowledge and detail of that particular subject. So what you've seen tonight is what you've agreed to the business case that they will then follow on at the various other okay. does that make sense but, so the policy if we've just agreed the business case tonight then I'll... well the business case was because previously this committee as an as a as an indicator agree the town investment plan so the town investment plan is done and dusted. Uh, so now it's agreement in terms of a new project, the business, and then it will follow on. I think the points make, Lynn's making though is two of the new for 22-23, which will be for the almost for the next municipal year, have been achieved tonight. Yes, within this. So it's sort of that, that's why I think it's it might be worth us agreeing to have a, a little bit of a working group to look at some of these make sure they're, they're measuring the right things. This is officers' suggestions of those, but I don't think we necessarily can unpick it or want to unpick it tonight, but I think there is an opportunity to look again to make sure we're measuring the right things in this committee. So if that's agreeable to people, I suggest we agree this tonight and agree to uh, have a, have a cross-party look at this uh, in the next few months. Maybe after May the 5th. Okay, is that agreed? Can I see those in favour? That is agreed. Thank you. Right, we move on then to item 12, uh, the referral report from Place and Economic Development Committee. Um, <coughs> this is simply around the money. I, I, I'm, I'm sure you wouldn't want to stroll into the work of the Place and Economic Development Committee. I'm sure you, we, we'd respect their boundaries. So this is simply about the £40,000 to make to appoint the specialist contractor rather than the, rather than the debate about what this work is doing so um uh, it would have been lloyd is are you covering this one chair i'm happy sure. to take any questions I, I i note that chair and vice chair of ped aren't aren't here tonight to um, obviously introduce this referral report it's just a just a coincidence but i'm i'm happy to say that um you know a long and considered debate was had on this item the identification of a budget sum um, was in recognition of the fact that this is quite a quite a deep and meaningful piece of work which on a cross 
cross-committee basis members supported in order to do it properly and well external resources required that's provisionally being costed at 20,000 um, which can be met from an reserve so it's not a new budget pressure it's an allocation from existing reserve Mr Flynn you're going to add yeah, through you, Chair. So I've itemised four reserves which I've identified which could be brought into play, if I can put it that way. Um, uh, but I haven't specified a particular one because I still want to just do some due diligence around making sure that there are no other those, but there will be sufficient. That's a great sense. Chair, if I was cynical, which of course I'm not, I would say that the presentation of this report is much better tonight when you would rather we didn't discuss it than it was at PED when we did discuss it. Um, so uh, in, in that respect, um, I'm pleased and will use this piece of paper next time, but still request that the maps are bigger even now that they're now in colour. <laughs> I'm afraid I wasn't there, so I don't know. Okay, we'll we'll get bigger maps. Right, fine. Okay, are we? I'd propose that from the chair. Are we happy to agree that all those in favour? Agreed. Thank you very much. Right. There being no other business of sufficient urgency, I I wonder if somebody might move the relevant section to exclude the press and the public. Moved. So agreed. Thank you very much to the public and to the press for coming tonight uh, and, and lasting the whole meeting.